Believe it or not, we're in a different chapter today. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm very excited to share this with you today. Uh, Everybody in here, can you have an open mind for the Lord to speak through His Word? Is that all right? All right. Now, I didn't say have an open mind for me to give you my opinion, but let's have an open mind that the Word of God can speak to us, and so I, I think maybe we might look at something perhaps a little bit different than maybe you were told or thought, and so let's just do it and see what God has to say about His Word today, and uh, I called this faith to run your race. Look at your neighbor and tell him, you got a race to run. Tell him, say, you better get in shape. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, let's read verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So let's pray this morning. Father, thank you so much for your presence that is with us today as we worship you. Thank you for that anointing upon our praise team today and the singers and the people, God, as they brought glory and honor to you. I just praise you for it. I praise you for changing people's lives already in this service today. And we give you praise and glory. God, help me to speak your word today with uh, bold, boldness and authority and also simplicity. Because, Lord, no matter how it sounds, if we don't get it, then it doesn't help us. So help us to get it, what you're trying to say through your word today. And we just thank you and praise you and honor you in the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. All right. So, we've made it to a new chapter, but it's very important. In your Bible, there are chapters. They have numbers, right? Those chapters were not inspired by the Holy Spirit. The words were. And so, people put numbers there to try to help us keep up with what we're reading and they try to put it in places where it would fit uh, but the Holy Spirit inspired the words and so sometimes when we change a chapter our mind sort of turns a page and we forget where we've been it's very important as we talk today that you don't forget where we've been for the last few months in chapter 11 so that you'll truly get what God is trying to say in chapter 12 because there's a key word here and I don't know if you saw it but it what's that first word so 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 does that help you see he's alluding to what he just said in the previous chapter so don't forget that and so I want to start off by saying this you are surrounded by witnesses you're surrounded by witnesses in verse 1 He said, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, this passage, and what we're doing today shows you the importance. Because I believe this is going to come pretty easy to us. Because we've been living in the book of Hebrews, and we've lived in chapter 11 for several weeks. And now, as we're in chapter 12, it's fresh on our hearts, and it's not going to be hard for us to get But sometimes what happens when people just open up their Bible and they read a verse without knowing everything that's going on leading up to it and everything that took place after it, we can get the wrong message. And so that's why it's wonderful to read it in the context, and that's what we're doing today. If you just read this verse in Hebrews chapter 12, you just opened up your Bible and pretend you hadn't been in our series, and you just read that, you might end up with the wrong meaning. And I let me just go ahead and say, because I'm not trying to put anybody in a bad light, because I did this. I did this early on in, in my ministry. And you could probably go back on 
YouTube or Facebook and find a time where I've said it. You could probably go back to a funeral that I've done years ago and hear me say it. But how many has ever heard at a funeral in a sermon that this verse is brought up and they say something like this? You know, Uncle Joe, bless his heart. He's looking down on us today and he's just smiling. Have we heard it? I've said it, right? No place in the Bible does it say anything like that. People take it out of this verse right here. What I want to show you today is this verse right here says something so much better than Uncle Joe leaning over the balcony of heaven and looking down. It's so much more. Because I, you know, think it through for a minute. Let's just do that for a minute. What if Mama... You know, your mama's going on, she's teaching angels how to sing. What if she could open up the windows of heaven and look down? Does that sound like heaven for mama? Think it through. Does that sound like heaven for your dear sweet mama? Mm -mm. Now, if she caught you on a good day, she could smile. But what if she caught you on one of those? <laughs> Mom will be coming down here with a switch. <laughs> I'm going to get you. So please hang with me. Don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me when I'm telling you. The Bible, nowhere does it say Mama's looking down on you. You don't want Mama looking. Do you want Mama looking at Fox News today? Huh? Do we want that? I don't know we don't. We just think mama looks down in the best moments. Well, how, how does that work then? Because you know in our best moments, there's still, it's still not 100% pure. And so nowhere in the Bible does it say if mama or mama or Mabel or Uncle Joe or anybody like that is, is looking down and smiling on us. The truth is, is that mama or mama or uncle... If they were a believer in Jesus, they have no desire to look down here and see all this mess. They already ran their race. They already had their turn. She's already entered into her joy. The joy of the Lord. And looking down here would just mess all that up. So she is. Well, pastor, how can you say that? Because you just read a verse that said... There's witnesses, a cloud of witnesses, and we're running, and it sure sounds like we're running. Uncle Bob, Mama Mabel is looking down and saying, you go get them. Let me walk us through it, because I'm going to tell you something. It's much better than that, so don't turn sour on me. Wait on me, because it's much, much better. It's much better than that. We've, we've been in chapter 11 for a long time. So let me ask you. You're the students today. When it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Remember the word therefore. Now, for those of you that's been listening to at least some of these sermons each week. Maybe you didn't sleep through half of it. You at least made it through part of it. And you heard what was said. Who are the witnesses that it's talking about? We're going to need to go back to Hebrews chapter 1 and start this all over again. Let me help you. Forget everything you've been told and just listen to what the Bible's saying to you today. Chapter 11 told us this. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, others that didn't mention their names. Chapter 11 talks about all of these people. Some of them received miracles because of their faith. Some of them died in faith. And so if we read this verse in context, the great cloud of witnesses are the heroes of chapter 11. That's where we got to start because that's what the Bible says very clear. Like you can't really argue that. It just said that to us. Now, does this mean that Abraham's watching us? Or that David is watching us, cheering us on? No. 
See, we gotta, we've got to think of this differently. When we hear the word witness, we automatically put ourselves in the center of that, and we're like, they're witnessing us. But that's not what they're witnessing. I need you to think of a, another way to see a witness. Does anybody watch uh, crime shows? April and I watch crime shows sometimes, or, or court drama, whatever they call. You know, it's in the courtroom, and they're battling it out. That's pretty cool to watch. And so you're in a courtroom, and the defense is trying to get their guy off the hook, and the prosecution is trying to get him life in you know, prison, and, and it's going back and forth. And so the prosecution brings this person up who saw what happened. Now, what do they call him? Call him a witness, right? So maybe he's a key witness because, like, he was there. He knew what happened. Now, because he's a witness, he's about to do what? Testify. Testify. Y'all are doing really good now. I really, I was like praying for y'all the first few minutes. I'm like, what in the world's happening here? <laughs> I, think when I, I think when I threatened to go back to Hebrews chapter 1, y'all are like, oh, my, I'm up now, I'm up now, let's get this done. It's been a long time, Pastor. So his testimony was very important because he was a witness. The heroes of the faith don't think about them as people witnessing what you're doing. Think about them as lives that were lived by faith and that's a testimony to us to say if God did it with them he can do it for us do you understand are we getting it now because if you can get this it's going to be so much better than Mama Mabel looking down at you and saying I sure am proud of her it's much better than that their lives and their deaths are a witness a testimony of what faith in God can do. And so we know from chapter 11 that the Bible says that faith in God can cause you just to be walking with God and God just take you home. One minute you're here, one minute you're there. Faith in God can cause you to build a boat in the desert and save your family. Faith in God can make you a father of many nations when you don't even have a kid yet at 100 years old. Faith in God can cause you to wrestle with God and not only survive, but have Him change your name to Israel. Faith in God can cause you to have a baby at nine years old. Faith in God can trust God in the pit and in the prison and be elevated to the palace. Faith in God can cause you to lead two million stubborn, stiff-necked people out of Egypt and through the wilderness. Faith in God can change your reputation from a harlot to the great-grandmother of King David. Faith in God can take 300 guys armed with mason jars, candles, and trumpets and defeat hundreds of thousands. Faith in God can cause you to leave this world and overcome her even after you followed your flesh to a place of blindness and embarrassment. Talk to Samson about that. Faith in God can cause you to look at a giant and say, how dare you defy the living God? <laughs> faith in God can cause you to understand that when people reject you because of your faith, they're really rejecting God. Faith in God can cause you to stand up to hundreds of false prophets and pray a simple prayer and see the one true God answer. Faith in God can cause you to walk through the fire without getting burned or even smelling like smoke. Faith in God can cause you to snuggle up with a lion and live to tell about it. But remember the end of the chapter. Faith in God can cause you to be burned at the stake, but not forsake the Lord. Faith in God can cause you to be sawn in half, but not forsake the Lord. Faith in God can cause you to lose everything, but not lose him. Now do you get it? Now can you see that great cloud of witnesses around you 
Their lives that were well lived are a testimony for us to keep on going no matter what. And now that you see it in that context, you can go ahead and put Mama Mabel in that cloud. Not because she's a witness that's looking down on you, but because she was a praying woman. And she left a testimony of faith and godliness and prayer for you to follow. Are you understanding? This is that cloud of witness. Not that they have any desire whatsoever to look down here. But what they left, the race they ran, the testimony that they left behind... It serves as a cloud for us to know that we can do this and we can walk through this and we can face this and we can overcome that because we trust in the same God that they trusted in. You know, maybe you remember about your grandmother. She didn't even have two nickels to rub together, but you have memories of her cooking in the kitchen and taking care of her family. You knew she had a hard life, but you can hear her sing songs like, Ain't God Good to give us so many blessings. And Jesus is the sweetest name I know. That right there is your cloud of witnesses. They're not witnessing you. Their lives are witnessing to you. They are a testimony it says, they've passed the baton. And now you've got a race to run. We all have a race to run. Look at what it says in verse 1. It says, let us also lay aside every weight. Seeing that we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We have a race to run. I want you to notice a few things here. It is the race that is set before us. Well, let me say specifically, it is the race that is set before you. In other words, God has placed you on an ordained path that he made just for you. He's not asking you to run the race of Abraham. He's not asking you to run the race of Mama Mabel. He's called you to run the race and to keep the faith and the purpose and the plan that he has made specifically for you. And you're like, well, I really screwed this up, Pastor. I'm like one of those NASCAR drivers, and all I do is turn left, and I just go in circles. I ain't watching it. I take a nap. Take a nap during that. That's what I'll do. <laughs> You're like, I've messed it all up. I had a race to run. And I've made so many mistakes, and I've, I've ruined it. You see, you're minimizing how big God is. You're minimizing the fact that you're like assuming that God didn't know you was going to make all those mistakes, and that God didn't know you was going to end up where you've ended up, and that God didn't somehow have a path for you that included a testimony coming out of those things. I specifically brought up Samson. The dude couldn't stay away from women he just could not help himself. And it caused him to be blinded. It caused him to lose what, what the source of his strength was. It caused him to lose everything. But he left this world an overcomer. Because even though he made all those loop-de-loops and got off at the wrong exits, he came to a place, which I'm praying that many of you would come to today, where he's like, you know what? Your way is better. And the path you have for me is better than the one I'm trying to make myself. 
So you're in this race, and really you have one thing to do. Anybody ever tell your kids that? I gave you one thing to do. Keep the faith. Trust God. Believe. As long as you keep on believing, you'll leap every hurdle. You'll get back up when you fall. You'll run. You'll give God the glory. Well, there's something about this race, and I know that you've all figured this out by now, is that we've got, we got an enemy who would love to trip us up, who would love to put us on the sidelines, who would love to get us out of this race. And he would love that. Because if we're running, we're bringing God glory, and people are coming into the kingdom because they're watching you run. And so it's important that we do it, but the enemy wants to stop us. And so he has a plan to slow us down. He has a plan to stop us. And this scripture, if you want to back up to the scripture, actually tells us what these, this plan is. It's two things. One of them is wait. If you heard the passage, it said wait. Let me go back and read it to you. Let us lay aside every weight, it says. Wait. That's one of his tactics. Nothing will slow a runner down like weight. Trust me. Just trust me. <laughs> Y'all, I used to be fast. I mean, I was fast. We used to play football in the backyard, and Pastor Brian throw that football about 200 yards. But no matter how hard he threw it, boy, I could run and I'd get up under it. And ain't nobody going to stop us. Like, you just throw it hard as you can and I'll run as fast as I can and it's done. I was fast. I ain't fast. No more. <laughs> uh-uh. I ain't been walking in it a while either. I'm, it's gotten that bad. There for, a while I, there for a while I get up and walk every morning. I'm getting back to it, Pastor Ape, I promise. Get up and walk, and it's really nice just to walk the golf course, about two and a half miles to walk around one loop. And so I'd walk, and after about three weeks of walking every day, I started feeling a little more spry, you know, like my body was tricking me is what it was doing. And so about halfway into my walking one morning, I'm like, you know, I think I can... And that's exactly what I did, just sort of in place, and I went back to walking. <laughs> Wait. It's hard to run when you're carrying a shot put. It's hard to run. Wait, when the Bible talks about it, it, it can become sin, but it isn't necessarily sin. Because the writer is going to talk about sin as well. It's in that same verse, so... He mentions weight, and he mentions sin. So weight is anything that slows down or hinders your faith to run the race. Think of weight as distractions. Anything that can take over your thoughts, fill up your days, your weeks, your months, until you just quit running. For some of us, weight can be the weight of grief. You lost somebody you really cared about. The weight's so heavy, you just don't run anymore. For some people, the weight can be like financial debt. You're just overwhelmed with debt and you become so burdened. You just don't feel like you can run anymore. Sometimes it can be work. You can be a, like a workaholic and it's all you do and it can become a weight to your race. Sometimes it can be family issues. You know, you got that wayward child and you just want to do anything in the world to help them and they don't always want to cooperate or they never want to cooperate and you're like, it weighed, and for long you realize, man, I'm not running because I got this weight. And weight can be pretty much anything. It can even be too much of something good. So what do you do with weight? Our scripture tells us just to lay it aside. To lay it aside. Does that mean we quit paying our debts <laughs> if they're the weight? No. Does it mean we quit working at all if, if working too much was a way? No. 
But it might mean that we need to find some balance. And we'll know when we find the balance when we find we start running again. We know that we're going in the right direction. So maybe you got some weight. Maybe there's something weighing you down. Lay it aside. Get back in the race. And then he says sin. The sin that clings so closely. Uh, the New King James Version says it is the sin which so easily besets us. Now this one's easy to understand. Weight can be fuzzy gray areas that you have to pray about. Sin is straightforward. It is hard to run the race of faith and practice sin at the same time. I mean, think about it. The Bible says that there's a path that leads to destruction and there is a path that is narrow that leads to life. And we know that when we trusted Jesus, He placed us on a narrow path that leads to life. And when we make the decision to practice sin, it is not an accident. It has not caught me off guard. It is not I made a mistake. You make the decision to practice sin, you end up in a very confusing, shameful kind of way of thinking, condemning way of thinking. You end up in a weird place, and you don't know what's what because you're on a narrow path that the Lord has placed you on, but you're walking like you're on the path that leads to destruction. And so how are you going to run a race if that's the life that you're living We quit running. We're wearing his name on our jersey like we're in this race. But we're making the choice to practice what he died for. And it's hard to run like that. And it leaves us confused on the sidelines, stale. So what does the Bible tell us to do about the sin that's keeping us from running? Same thing as the weight. It says lay it aside. Just like the weight. Lay it aside. You see, our sins have been atoned for. Jesus was the perfect one time for all time sacrifice for our sins. It has been washed away. Where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. So for the believer, we treat it just like we do the weight that hinders us. We lay it aside and we keep on running the race. We don't wallow in our failures. We don't get in a pity potter. We don't party. We don't wonder if he still loves us. We don't perform a seance. We don't try to cast out demons. We don't try to rebuke generational curses. It was sin. Jesus paid for it. You lay it aside. You thank Jesus for the forgiveness that he gave you when he died on the cross and the finished work of Christ over your life. And you get back in the race and you run. You get back in the race, and you run. Why do we as believers act like sometimes Jesus puts us in timeout? We'd all be in timeout. You're making it sound easy, Pastor, I know. It's not easy. It's not easy to lay aside the weight. It's not easy to lay aside the sin. You're right, it's not easy. That's why I love the Bible. Because the Bible not only tells us what to do, it also tells us how to do it. The Bible says, lay aside the weight and run the race that is set before you. The Bible says, lay aside the sin and run the race that is set before you. And this is how the Bible tells us how we're going to do it. The Bible says, look to Jesus. Look at verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. The New King James says, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This not only tells us how to lay aside weight and sin by looking to Jesus, but it also explains to us why we picked up the weight and why we picked up the sin to start with. If you're on the sidelines today and you're not running in this race, it's because somewhere you got distracted and your eyes went off of Christ and you started looking somewhere else.
You ever tried to run while looking at your feet? If you're like me, you don't because you can't see them that good. So think way back. Think way back. You know, it breaks my heart. The only joke y'all ever laugh about is the ones where I make fun of myself. <laughs> y'all got to get it together. At least for the sake of my feelings. I mean, I say some good ones, y'all, like crickets. Make fun of me. And, ah, it's funny. He's so funny. He's so funny. I love it. <laughs> when you were a little kid, I don't know about you, but when I was a little kid and I got new shoes, I thought they made me faster. Y'all remember that? And I think every boy thinks that. I don't know about the girls. I wasn't a girl. Back then, we knew what we were when we was born. But anyway, let's go on. <laughs> Let's move forward. Let's just move forward. Let's move on. So, so, <laughs> we got distracted. Look at any boy, gets a new pair of shoes, and just let him get outside with them. What's the first thing he's going to do? He's going to take off. I always thought I was faster with those new shoes. You know, especially if there's one you saw, you like those, they got flashing lights or something, they got to make you faster. And so I don't know about you too, as, as a boy, I get those new shoes, I start running, I've been watching my feet, you know, because you got to see how fast those feet, boy, them things are, you know what happens when you do that? Trees get in your way. <laughs> Trees get in your way. There y'all go again laughing at my calamity. Things will get in your way if you're looking at your feet. That's why a lot of us stay in the place we're at without ever progressing. Because you're trying to run a race while observing how you're doing at the same time and judging yourself every day. Probably comparing yourself to somebody else. Never thinking you're cut out. And God never asked you to look at your feet. <laughs> he asked you to look at Him. He asked you to look to Him. That's what he did. Look at him. See, that ain't just true for me, Pastor April. We, we go ride bikes at Ladaga Trail in Weaver. It's flat, but on the sides, it's some drop off in some places. And we're driving side by side on our bicycles. Our bicycles, I don't know what kind they are. We bought those bicycles Back when we first got married, 25 years ago, we still got the same bicycles. I've never put a chain on them. I mean, nothing. They just pump up the tires every year, and they, I don't know how they make bikes like that. We buy bikes for the kids, and they break before the third time we use them. But these bikes we got, they just never broke. So anyway, we're going down the trail, and, you know, I'm on the right, and she's on the left, and, you know, we're not the best at biking, and... But the path's pretty big, so we can ride beside each other. And you ride on those trails, you see animals and stuff. And I remember one time I saw a cute little bunny rabbit over here. And I said, look, April, a rabbit. And uh, she looked over that rabbit, and she's looking right. Her bike just went left. She said, Shh. <laughs> There goes Pastor April. She's seeing lots of rabbits down there. Turkeys, squirrels, chipmunks. <laughs> they laugh at you, too, so. <laughs> Mary ain't laughing. She looks mad at me. <laughs> I'm moving on, Mary. I'm moving on. The point is, well, first off, the point is I never ask April to look at scenery or she becomes the scenery. So we don't do that. He asks us to look at him. I've read, I've read about those who running those races with the hurdles. You know that they jump over the hurdles. I've heard that they are taught not to look at the hurdles. That they look above the hurdles. That if they look at the hurdles, they'll end up in the hurdles. And so they're taught to look above the hurdles. That's a pretty good point. He's asked us to look to Him. It's pretty simple instructions by the Lord. Run the race that I've set before you and do it by looking 
at me. We take our eyes off Jesus. We look at the weight and we pick it up. We look at the sin and we take it on. So this is a good time to go back to that cloud of witnesses for a minute. Because, you know, what are, what are they saying with the lives that they lived? What are they saying? They're saying, trust God. If He brings you to it, He'll bring you through it. If you're threatened with fire, don't bend, don't bow. And God is able to keep you from burning. But if you burn, trust God. Trust God. That's hard to say, isn't it? We have Bibles today, by the way. That Bible you got that you can open up and read, you've got it because people were willing to be burned at the stake to put it in a language that you could read it. Think about that. What if they had been like we are sometimes? That if God doesn't deliver us or save us from every pain, every illness, we're just like big crybabies. And where's my faith? And where's the, what went wrong? And I'm not giving enough money. You know, what, what happened? Thank God for people who are willing to suffer so that we could have what we have. So I think we need to also grow up and put our eyes on Jesus. They're saying, this cloud of witnesses are saying, fix your eyes on Jesus. It specifically talks about that towards the end of the chapter. Go back and read it. It says they were looking forward to something they never got to see. Like they didn't get to see Jesus finish the job. By faith, they looked to it, but they never got to receive it. We having something better. So we've got him. And if the cloud isn't enough for us to tell us that we can trust God, He is more than, than enough. Because He is the founder or the author of our faith. And He is the finisher or the perfecter of our faith. His race. He's not asking us to run a race. He hasn't run. His race included a cross meant for me. And the Bible says that he endured it because of the joy that was set before him. That's what our scripture says. Did I get it right? Yeah. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So what was the joy that was set before him? Was it heaven? It wasn't heaven. He already had heaven. Was it the Father's love? It wasn't the Father's love. He already had that. Was it, was it a throne? He already had a throne. His joy was our redemption. <laughs> His joy was our redemption. So when he says, look at me, get your eyes off the weight and the sin and the distractions and look at me and just trust me and run your race. The joy that was set before him that caused him to be beaten, scourged, and crucified, yet he endured it. Even the wrath of the Father. So that he could finish the work of redemption. So that you could one day be a part of that cloud of witnesses. Now picture it. Now he is seated. Can you picture it? He's seated. The priest in the temple, Hebrews taught us this. They never sat down because there's always something to do. He is seated today. Because he has finished the work of our redemption. He's seated. And we, picture it, we who are called by His name. 
We are all running home on the path that he has set before us. If you close your eyes and our praise team will come to the music. If you're a child of God and you're not running, this message, if it brings you condemnation, you're not hearing it. If it brings you shame, you're not hearing it. This message should bring you hope that God has not changed His mind about you. Now, there's nothing the enemy would want more than for you to sit there on the sidelines, weighted down. But I think it's high time that you laid aside the weight and you laid aside that that sin that so easily entangles and ensnares you. And you let it keep you from running. And by not running, you get more entangled. I feel like sometimes if we could see that, that you get, you get entangled with that, that sin, you know, if you just get up, keep on running the race, it can't hold on. But if you stay there, and continue to stay there, and continue to stay there, you get more and more and more entangled by that sin that so easily ensnares you. Because you've got a race to run. You've got a testimony to complete. And you may be that person that, you know, when you're gone, you're, those that you've influenced in this life, they may say, you know, that guy, he was just, he served the Lord all his life, and he... He really was a picture of what God has called us to be and He really did influence and encourage other people and maybe that's you or maybe you're the guy that somebody says, you know what? He went through a lot of junk. He made a lot of bad choices. And he ended up in some bad places. But He came out. He came out. He was one of the ones who came out and ran their race. And that guy, that lady, man, what an encouragement they are for others that are entangled and weighted down. Y'all, we got to look to Jesus. He is the answer. There's never going to be a better answer. There's never going to be another answer. The answer to all of life's problems and all of your problems and all that you're facing is to set your eyes on Jesus. I want to tell you something. He is here. The King is in the room today. So as you stand with me, if God leads you to come and pray or God just leads you to talk with Him right there where you are or you want to worship, I'm not going to tell you what to do. God will do His thing. But I want you to open up your heart and open up your mind and let the Lord speak to you. Maybe you need to fix your eyes upon Him today. Let's do it.